All right. So I want to welcome everybody to our Polar Connect event. Um, we are very excited today it, on this, this uh, sunny day in Anchorage, Alaska, August 15th, 2019. We'll hear from our teacher, Kate Steeper, and the research team that she has put around her, I guess, up there at Tulick Field Station. Um, we're going to be learning about snow, sh sh snow, shrubs, snow, and nitrogen in the Arctic. So looking forward to this upcoming uh, webinar and information that they're gonna relay. Um, in uh, the next few minutes, I'll turn this over to Kate, but before we do, I just wanna let everybody know, um, and Kate, you can switch the slide for me. <laughs> I forgot to let you know that part. Um, that if you're just joining us, feel free to type in the chat area where you're coming from uh, so we get an idea of who's with us in the room. Um, if you have any students, and just for fun, because everybody's having such extreme temperatures across the nation today, um, please put what your temperature is in your current area today, because I think you'll see it's fairly extreme from the Arctic to wherever you're joining us. Um, so the reason why uh, Kate is in the Arctic with uh, Dr. Bret Hart is because she's part of the Polar Trek program and Polar Trek is for teachers and researchers exploring and collaborating. We're funded gratefully by the National Science Foundation and have been for quite a while. And we place educators, uh, teachers and informal science educators with researchers like Dr. Bret Hart up in the Arctic and also down south in Antarctica. And we've been doing this for quite a while and we're really excited to continue these uh, collaborations and get the polar science out to people like you. Um, we are, uh, Polar Trek is run by a nonprofit called the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, or ARCUS, and myself, Janet Warburton, and my colleague, Judy Fonstock, both work for ARCUS, and we have about, I don't know, 15 or so employees that work with um, scientists around the globe. So with that, let's see, the next little bit is about questions. If you have questions that come up during the presentation, we're going to ask that you just type them in the chat area and we will interrupt uh, Kate and the team with relevant questions during the presentation. Um, at the end, um, we're hoping to have a, at least a good 10 minutes for people to ask their questions live if they want. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, this event is being archived and we'll send it out to everyone that's registered. Um, so I think that's it. Uh, we'll get started. So Kate, it's your turn. All right, so uh, I guess I'll, I'll start with introducing myself here. So I'm Kate Steeper and I'm a chemistry teacher at a uh, high school, uh, Lenox Academy in Inglewood. Um, and I just have to piggyback off of what was just said. Polar Trek is an amazing program and I've had just a really great experience here. Um, to my left over here is Dr. Brett Hart. I thought I'd let you introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Doni Brett Hart. I'm a faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and I've been working in the Arctic for over 20 years now. Uh, and I was really excited to have Kate come and help with this project. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks up here for the summer working with Dr. Bret Hart. And yeah, I'm a biology student and studying mostly focusing in ecology and evolution. Yeah. And Emily, Emily's also getting a, a double major here in Spanish as well. Um, so I, I thought we'd invite her on because uh, she's been sort of an integral part of the project this summer and um, she's in a few of our pictures here. So I thought I'd invite her on and kind of let her comment as needed. So um, where we are right now is in Tulik Field Research Station and the picture from uh, one of the drones is right here. Um, we are actually in what, this building right here? Mm -hmm. The dining hall. So we're in the dining hall right here. Um, and Tulik is about a nine and a half hour drive north of Fairbanks. So here's Fairbanks and Tulik Field Station is all the way up here. It's a very um, kind of rough dirt road that's ma mainly used for trucks um, on the Alaskan pipeline. Uh, so it's a pretty 
long drive up there. Um, and we're a little bit past the Arctic Circle. And it's almost, uh, it's all completely tundra up here. Um, and the, the research station is really kind of this um, area where scientists from all over the world um, kind of come to study different things. And some people will stay here for a couple days and some people will stay here for months at a time. Um, so one of the, the questions is really why study here? So I thought I'd let you kind of introduce this one. Sure, so I'll just jump in and say that the Arctic um, is an area that gets uh, 24 hours of light in the summer and 24 hours of darkness in the winter. And because of that, the temperatures here are much lower um, because the sun is at a shallow angle in the summer and doesn't really heat things up that much. And most of the heat really falls around the equator. So because the Arctic is cold and wet in the summer and frozen in the winter, there's a tremendous amount of carbon that's been stored here over millennia. So plants grow in the short summer and then eventually they die and they turn into peat. And because we're up in this cold climate, it doesn't decompose very quickly. So permafrost is, is uh, soil that's frozen for more than, than uh, two years in a row. And there's a lot of permafrost up here. Um, and uh, that permafrost, it also protects the carbon that's in the soil by keeping microbes from, from working on it. And in the permafrost containing parts of the world, which is basically mostly the Northern hemisphere, there's about two and a half times as much carbon uh, in the soils and plants as there is in the atmosphere. So if that, as climate warms, um, if that carbon is to get mobilized, then that would have a tremendous positive feedback to further warming by putting lots of CO2 and methane, which are both powerful greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So here at Tulik, there's a lot of work that goes on trying to figure out how that carbon, what, what's gonna happen to all that carbon in the soil? Is it all going to be released? Is some of it going to be released? How fast is it going to be released? These are all questions that have a, a strong um, implications for the rest of us in the in the rest of the world. And as you are probably aware, you know things are warming rather quickly, especially quickly in the Arctic. But even even in the rest of the world, this is an exceptionally hot year, 2019. So um, so my project here is focusing on the relationship between shrubs and nitrogen and carbon cycling in the soil. And so uh, in this area, um, it's all tundra as Kate mentioned. And we think that shrubs um, can affect the cycling of, of carbon in a variety of ways. So they can interact um, because they trap snow and snow insulates the soil. So that's one feedback loop that they can increase soil temperature and potentially decomposition over the winter. That's on the right hand side of, side of the slide. Um, they also affect the carbon in the soil just by the quality and quantity of the leaf and stem litter that they produce. So this material that, you know, was once alive and then falls onto the ground and gets decomposed by microbes in the soil, to the extent that it tends to be easy to decompose, it speeds up decomposition. If it's hard to decompose, it can retard it. But most shrub leaf litter is pretty juicy. And then also, interestingly, there are some shrubs that have these fascinating associations with microbes where they can actually fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere. And that's really a focus of uh, our work this year because these uh, alder shrubs form a symbiotic association with the Frankia bacteria and then they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And when their leaf litter decays, that puts a lot of nitrogen into the soil. So we are interested in understanding how the tundra that's dominated by alders is different from the tundra that has other types of shrubs that don't fix nitrogen. And then finally, there's a, also a feedback through uh, affecting the moss species composition in the moss communities that are associated with the, all, with the uh, shrubs. But I'm not gonna talk about that because this year we were really focusing on the end fixation by alder and feedback through alder litter to decomposition piece and so for the project that Kate was helping with, we were um, harvesting biomass and soils from a site that's, that's lower in elevation and farther north than Tulip called Sagwan, where there are lots of big alders. So I'll let Kate talk about that now. So, and I guess we could, we could kind of, just to really briefly, I guess we could go back to this. Um, what is the tundra that we kind of forgot to mention? So the tundra is sort of this, this region um, that can um, occur at elevation or at these different latitudes um, around the, the Arctic Circle. So it's um, kind of above the, the taiga right here and um, 
kind of right before the, the polar ice. So there was a question earlier about, do we get a lot of snow up here? I haven't seen any this year. We get about a half a meter of snow this year and that, or uh, most years, half a meter of snow. And that's not very much. It's not as much as you would think. Um, lots of places like the coastal rainforest of Alaska get a lot more. But the reason uh, why we don't get a lot of snow here is that in the winter it's extremely cold and the air doesn't hold very much moisture. So uh, this, and, and this, when the sea is frozen over, there's not a big source of moisture on the coast. So we've been getting a lot of rain this summer because in part because the Arctic Ocean is very open right now and there's not very much sea ice. There's a nice source of moisture off the coast that's been coming in from the Northwest. Um, but in the winter, once the sea freezes over, there's not that much snow that falls. Enough, it's just enough snow to, that, you know, it's, it's not much above the height of the shrubs and that therefore they can influence what happens. So, um, and then our, our site that we were doing harvesting this year was called Sagwan and it's uh, what, a two hour drive north? Two hour here? drive north, yep. Um, so it's a, a very long drive out there um, and it's right along the, the Sagwan River um, and kind of up against the foothills right here. Sagwan Bluffs. The bluffs, um, and we've got multiple sites. So this was just sort of a, a brief screenshot, and there are um, snow fences kind of along these sites. Um, and uh, Dr. Brett Hart here just talked about um, nitrogen fixation um, by alder shrubs. So over on the right, over here is uh, an alder shrub, uh, and the nitrogen fixation is occurring in these nodules right here that can be found on the roots. So these are kind of like little houses or homes for bacteria that convert nitrogen that living organisms um, or plants and animals usually can't convert into more usable forms. Um, so let's see here. So we did anything else on the slide? Go ahead. Um, so when we were harvesting, uh, I thought I'd include a picture here. So we have to hike out tons of equipment um, and uh, Walking in the tundra is uh, not what you would expect. Uh, when you look over it, it looks very um, sort of uh, grassy, nice and hilly, like little rolling hills, but um, it's very, very uneven surfaces with lots of sort of moss. So you can have your foot give way a solid six to 12 inches sometimes. Um, so it takes kind of a lot of work to hike around through the tundra um, and hiking out all of this equipment was uh, pretty intense. Uh, once we got out to the site, then we'd um, set up these transects and um, kind of through random plots, we would um, set up these quadrants, these um, meter by meter sort of quadrants here, and we would harvest all of the biomass uh, within this meter by meter quadrant. Um, and then, so we'd have this sort of um, PVC pipe square that would be moving down some poles. You can kind of see them over here. Um, and then once we got down to the bottom and we had removed all of the biomass on the inside, um, in the kind of top story. Um, then we would take three smaller um, kind of quadrants here and we uh, remove out what we like to call tundra cakes. Um, I don't, how thick do you think those things were? 10 centimeters maybe. So about 10, 10 centimeters. 10 to 20 centimeters. Uh, and once we had harvested all of that, then we would take this back to the lab. Uh, for what was lovingly deemed the pluck. Um, so uh, here's sort of some some pictures of the upper story that we had. So first we'd have to sort of isolate out things that were alive, attached, um, and then we'd start having to um, isolate some of the new growth versus the old growth. Um, and I think we counted about 18 volunteers, 19 volunteers this year. Mm -hmm. so there were about 20 people all together on the team from um, Northern Arizona University and also from UAF associated with UAF. It's we have to do this fairly quickly so things don't sort of change a lot during the course of the of the harvest. So we have we have lots and lots <laughs> of people working on this. Um, here's sort of our our tundra cake here. So this is um, one of the three smaller kind of 20 by 20 centimeter um, quadrants that we were taking out um, and we'd have to go through and isolate very carefully kind of all of the different plant species um, identify different roots, those nodules that we showed earlier, um, and um, catalog all of those for weighing. Um, we also went back out of the field and did some stem measurements at one point, um, just to better uh, catalog biomass. It's another index of biomass. Um, so that's um, also 
Emily and I can kind of speak to this. This is uh, very difficult to kind of jump in there and measure kind of every single living stem of these different species that we were looking at um, with these calipers um, and then calling out the different measurements while Dr. Bret Hart was having to like write them down in a notebook. Um, so that's uh, what the stem measurement was. Is there anything that I... So just by looking at stem density and diameter, that gives us an indirect measure of biomass. And we're just adding to that. I wanted to compare how that compares with the, what you get by direct measurement with the quadrats. And also, it just gives us a little more idea of variability within these patches, which are quite large. So it's, it's a part of this harvest thing as well, although we don't get any of the below ground information from this type of measurement. So um, really, it's been kind of an amazing experience. And I think that pluck took about a week and a half to do the, the plucking. The actual plucking was about a week, but the preparation for it, there was some preparation setting out the plots and everything that took more. And then obviously now with the weighing, that's taking another week or so. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Emily and I have been doing some, some weighing as well. Um, oh, and all of this um, mass that we were picking up earlier is also getting um, uh, put into ovens for drying. That's the other bit. And then eventually they're going to get shipped down to Fairbanks um, for kind of some more studies. Carbon and nitrogen content. Um, so there's, there's kind of a lot of people involved in this process. Um, and you're not doing a pluck next year, right? I have a lot of samples to analyze, so I'm going to wait for another year. <laughs> um, but but there, she does take volunteers sometimes, so yeah. if you're interested. Uh, I think there's an interview process. Um, so that's kind of um, a little bit of the science that we've been working on. I thought we'd kind of throw in some of the, the mammals that I've come across or at least been able to get pictures of. Um, so up on the top left, and by the way, we're in the North Slope region, um, which is kind of the region north of the, the Brooks Range. Um, so I've got a vole over here in the top left. He might be a little hard to see, but he's this little guy right here. Um, we have um, lots of ground squirrels here. Um, and there is a family of foxes on camp. So this was actually a kit. And we came across this kit when we were walking the, the boardwalks in the area. And the boardwalks are just right outside. And they're, um, I don't know, about three miles in total. Um, so we were walking around these boardwalks and this um, kit was trying to dig under the boardwalk, trying to get a ground squirrel that um, was uh, <laughs> refusing to move and the kit was just trying to dig through it and bite through the boards and stuff and um, it did not care that there were about 12 people waiting for it. Um, so it was really a uh, kind of fun experience. Um, this uh, animal over here is a ermine. Did I say that right? Ermine? Ermine. Ermine. Um, and it's a type of weasel, and this guy was also really interested in us. It kept on coming up to um, kind of the group. Uh, it's not very big. It's maybe like less than a foot long, um, but they're uh, very confident, um, little kind of interesting creatures. Um, and on our drives to and from Sagwan, we came across some um, musk ox, and so we had to stop and get pictures, and those guys are really cool. I actually picked up some, um, is it Quivic? Kiviet. Kiviet, I can't say it right. Um, it's, it's apparently very expensive and it's this sort of, um, some of the, the down fur. Um, so I'll bring it back to my classrooms to be able to, um, for kids to be able to see it. Um, we also have some kind of common flowers that I took some pictures of and blueberries. Um, I think Dr. Hart would be better at uh, telling us what all of these different species are. That I managed to get pictures of. Uh, well, the top left is what's called the shrubby cinquefoil. It's a type of potentilla and makes beautiful flowers pretty late in the year, so that's why Kate could get it photographed. Many of these are early flowers um, and they flower in June, this sort of short window. But actually, this year at Tulip was so warm and it started so early that a bunch of the plants um, escaped the inhibition of flowering that happens after the fruit is ripe, and that's called the post ripening period. And they thought it was spring and they're blooming again. So on the lower left, you see this um, bistort, uh, Polygonum bistorta, which is a beautiful pink flower on a stalk. And that's really next year's flower bud, but it shot up because the plants thought that it was spring. And so um, that's kind of an interesting thing. It happens periodically in really warm years, but it's very apparent this year. 
So that was a, an early spring flower blooming late and a lot of the other ericaceous shrubs are doing that too. And then there's some ripe blueberries and then it's on the right here is just uh, some willow. It looks like Salix alexensis, maybe the, the felt leaf willow. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, and um, I, I was reading in a book that there's actually around 18 different species of willow up here. And those were the ones that we were um, also trying to identify in our, our pluck. So um, these look vastly different, but a lot of the willows that we were encountering were kind of these shrubs. Um, that uh, needed special identification. Um, so those were some of the kind of plants and animals that we've been seeing up here. Um, and are there any cranberries? Yes. Lots of cranberries. Lots of cranberries. And cranberry flowers coming out prematurely. So maybe not so many cranberries next year. <laughs> Emily can attest to all the different berries. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we like to snack on the berries when we're harvesting. Um, and uh, do we have time to kind of briefly run through this? There was a question also about you in the research team. Um, yes, yeah, so it's, I think it's awesome to have Kate and other Polar Trek teachers work, working with us because um, all of the NSF projects uh, expect that you should have outreach uh, to the community and this is a really good way to reach people who are at a young stage in their life who might become interested in becoming scientists um, and we hope that uh, having Emily and I are here are providing some positive role models of women that can be scientists and it's also just really helpful to be able to yeah to expand the reach of the research uh, into um, to folks that might not have had the opportunity to hear about the Arctic personally much before. Um, yeah, this has been just an amazing experience, um, just being able to work with Dr. Breckhart. My background has been in cell biology, so it's been a um, pretty eye-opening experience just to kind of see the, the commonalities and the differences between um, kind of field research and um, cell biology research. It's been really interesting. Um, Hi, this is Judy. Oh, there's just a couple other questions here. Um, I'm just going to backtrack. Um, this one's actually mine. Um, I was wondering whether uh, where Dr. Bret Hart stores all the dried plant material back at UAF. It seems like there would be quite a bit there. Yeah, you should see my lab. Uh, it's not very, it's, it's full of boxes of plant material that we're in the process of working up. And then I also have a storage room in the basement. So, but we're getting really full. That's one of the reasons why we need to, you know, kind of get through the processing of a lot of these samples. Um, yeah, and sometimes we put them in sheds and stuff. So yeah, once they're dried, they're very stable. So until they can be ground into powder and run on a CHN analyzer, um, they're, they're stable once they're dried. So it's just a question of finding space for them, which is getting to be a little challenging now, <laughs> especially these big shrubs, they take up a lot of space. Um, you may have touched on this already. There's a question. Um, the flowers have been amazing this year. Lots of late bloomers. Why is this? Yeah, so there, so there's this phenomenon that a lot of um, Arctic plants have where, you know, they bloom and then they preform their flower buds for the next year so that when the spring comes, they can just go right into the blooming period. And that makes sense because the growing season is really short. So they want to bloom pretty early and then be able to make um, fruits and have those fruits become ripe and able to disperse before the season ends. But this year at Tulik was very unusual in that the plants came out almost a month earlier than usual. And so because of that, um, most, most plant species that are perennials have what's called a post ripening period where their further flowering is inhibited and that helps them to make sure that they're flower buds don't bloom precociously, right? Because if you bloom in August and then the snows come, you know, a week after you have your flower, well, you can't uh, have, have it get pollinated and set seed in that short a window of time. So they have this post-ripening period that inhibits their flowering, but because the season started so early this year, a lot of them have escaped that post-ripening period now, and it's, it's been so warm for so long that they've been fooled into thinking that it's spring again. And there, a lot of them are blooming um, very late. And that of course is, is bad in the sense that they have now wasted the resources that go into that flower because that flower is not gonna be able to successfully um, be fertilized and, and make seeds before the winter comes. So that particular plant um, 
if it's like polygonum, the one in the lower left corner, that makes only one inflorescence bud a year. So that particular plant won't be able to bloom next year because it's already spent its flower bud for next year by blooming in August. But it's not that every flower bud is coming out now. So this isn't something that's probably going to kill off any populations. They're all perennials. And so they may just have to take a gap year, so to speak, and then bloom again the following year. But it is a waste of their, of their resources, their time and effort uh, when this happens. And it happens, it'll probably start happening more and more as the, as the climate continues to warm. So it might, in the end, it might later on have a, a population impact. But right now, it's just sort of a a quirky thing that's happening that tells you that this is a really unusually warm year. We had a very early spring in Alaska. The snow melted off in Fairbanks in March, which is not the case usually. And then the sea ice started melting very early. And the sea ice on the, on the Arctic Ocean is going to probably be the lowest ever in September. That's what it looks like right now. So it's just the, the ocean off the coast of Greenland and off the coast of, of Alaska right now is about five degrees centigrade or nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer than usual. That's a big increase in water temperature. So this is just a really warm and unusual year here. And the plants having this extra flowering period is showing that, that they're responding to this unusually warm and very long uh, summer up here for them. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting and, and worrisome also. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Um, there, let's see, A. Gonzalez says, uh, Mrs. Steeper, my students want to know if you've studied an the animals and are they getting skinnier? Uh, we have not studied the animals. We're focusing on, on plants. And hi, Ms. Gonzalez. Um, we, we focus on just plants. Um, I, can you speak to? Um, yeah, our, this project is not, of course, focused on animals. There are folks that do look at the animals. Um, and I, I, I can't really say whether they're getting skinnier or not. The foxes, uh, this is a, a little marginal habitat for them. So I can tell you that the kit foxes look beautiful and sleek and well-fed. And the parents look kind of ragged, like, you know, they're eating us out of house and home. So the kit looks great, but the parents are like, oh my God. It needs another vol snack, yet another vol snack. So they're they're uh, they're looking like they're putting their resources toward their young, and they're looking a little thin themselves. But I don't think that that's a climate related thing. I think that's just having hungry teenagers in the house. Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll just do one more and let you go um, on with your presentation. Um, a Gonzalez again was asking, does the temperature fluctuate there every day, and how cold and how hot? Um, yes, it does fluctuate uh, on a daily basis. It's always cooler at night than it is during the day. Um, how much depends on where you are in the annual cycle. So like right near the solstice, the sun never goes down and it's, it's 24 hours of light. And so at that period, it is usually cooler at night, but not very much cooler. And then right now we're having darknesses coming back. And so it's quite a bit cooler at night. And it's probably, you know, I don't know, 10 or 20 degrees cooler at night. Um, and then, of course, once you get into the depths of winter, then it doesn't fluctuate much because it's just dark all the time up here and the nighttime and, and daytime temperatures are pretty similar. So it does depend on the time of year. And then um, when, she, when uh, Mrs. Gonzalez asks about whether the Arctic is melting by a significant amount, uh, the answer is yes, <laughs> it is melting by a significant amount. So that, that this um, thing with the sea ice melting and the the temperatures being a lot warmer and the permafrost is thawing. All of this is, is quite a big change compared to how it was, you know, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, or even since the last, uh, in the last, in the time that people have been on the planet. So things are warming up rapidly and, and changing at a rate that's much higher than past um, rates of change in the paleo climate record. Um. I, and I, I, if we have some time, we can go through this. If we, if we don't, then we can just kind of see if there's any more questions. Yeah, I think, I think you're fine uh, with time. So okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, because it's been raining so much, we've, we've kind of had a hard time. Sunday's usually our, our day off. We've been having a hard time kind of going out on hikes. But this last Sunday, um, the rain lifted for a little bit. So we were able to go to the Attigan Gorge, which is about a 20 or 30 minute drive um, south on the, the highway. Um, 
And so our group and some of the pluckers who are still here, our group started um, kind of at the, the road and we started walking, what direction were we walking? We were walking east. Eastward, okay. So we were walking eastward and you can kind of see the, the pipeline right here. Um, and so here's a good picture of the tundra where it looks like it's relatively easy to walk through. And I can tell you from experience, it's not. <laughs> um, and in fact, I think this whole area was pretty boggy and um, some of our, our group members had trouble kind of getting through this, this part as well. Um, and uh, our goal, so here's sort of the top of the hill um, from the road. Our goal was to kind of get over to one of these um, hillsides over here for some fossils. So we had to kind of walk along the, the river here to, to get up to this area. Um, and it was beautiful and, and scenic. We kind of walked past this is, um, molar up here that some people will walk around the back to. Um, and uh, we came across some grizzly tracks, we came across some wolf tracks, um, came across some doll sheep tracks, and we saw some on the other side of the canyon. Um, so that was uh, kind of cool. Um, at one point, our group sort of separated. And so uh, I found this picture and uh, you can see kind of the other half of the group is all the way out here, these little tiny, tiny dots. So this just gives you a good idea of the scale. Um, this was uh, about a 10 mile walk in total. So we probably walked about five miles out and five miles back. Um, and so eventually we kind of got up to the, the top of one of those ridges. This is one of the really um, beautiful waterfalls out there. And um, it's also known for these geodes in addition to the, the fossils that are on this side. So there's these really cool geodes and kind of rock formations around that we were um, kind of picking up and checking out. Um, and then these really cool fossils. So uh, brachio... Brachiopods. Brachiopods, thank you. So these were all brachiopods. Like ancient clams, kind of. Um, from the Devonian era? Uh, I'm not actually sure what the age of this particular ones were. The, the cap of rocks like on the other side is Devonian era limestone, about 430 million years old. But this side is actually not as old. But I don't know about this particular place. This clearly was an ancient seafloor um, that got uplifted and then eroded by the river. And so these um, shells of these clam-like organisms got compressed in, into the rock and the traces of them are, can still be seen. So we got to kind of um, kind of walk around this ridge and, and pick up some fossils and stuff. And it was really cool, um, really cold, really cold and really windy. Um, and I guess that was about it for that little slide there. I think there was a question here. Governor's proposed budget cuts. How is that going to impact your research? <laughs> Well, we've been spending a lot of time um, contacting our legislators and contacting the governor and worrying about this. And the good news is that fortunately, um, perhaps because there's a very active recall campaign going, the governor has backed off a bit and he agreed to cut the University of Alaska only 25 million instead of 136 million um, in this coming year. Uh, and then he intends to cut it further over time. The, my research is funded by the National Science Foundation, which is a, um, a national organization, and it doesn't, so his cuts wouldn't directly impact my research, except that as, um, as a faculty member at the University of Alaska, of course, my pay for myself, my own salary comes from a combination of federal grants and money from the University of Alaska. And at one point he was saying that he thought we should just get rid of research altogether which was a very strange um, point of view <laughs> to have from my point of view. And that would have impacted me greatly, but he seems to have backed off that for the time being. Um, and of course, you know, the, the Tulick Field Station, this, the center that we're here is, is also funded primarily by federal money, but it relies on a lot of services from the university to take care of our hazardous materials, to run the payroll and, and the hiring process for people that work here. Um, we're, we're really embedded in the university. So, um, we, we do rely on having a strong university to keep us going and we have been uh, experiencing, everybody associated with the university has been experiencing a lot of stress due to the uncertainty and the sort of um, unusual approach to funding a university that this particular governor is taking. So, but fortunately it seems like we've gotten a reprieve at least for a year and, and uh, so we'll see what happens as the, as the next year comes around.
Do we know what happened to the scholarships? Scholarships were restored, fortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, um, that passed the legislature with a veto-proof majority, so he Sweet. accepted that. Yeah, so big changes. Um, were there other questions that we didn't see earlier? Might be one at the bottom. Oh, but it's hard to see. Um, let's see. I was just clarifying a few things along the way. We mentioned pipeline, and people might not be familiar with what the pipeline is. And so I was just stating that it carries oil from the North Slope of Alaska, where it's where it's uh, retrieved and sent down to uh, Valdez by oil tankers. Um, and then I also was just Claire giving some context to that uh, response by Doni about what's happening at the university and how it impacts her research. Um, let's for see. context, um, I was wondering how long did it take you to say walk out, uh, out through Attigan Gorge? So like five miles out, how long did it take you on the tundra? That was Six months or six hours? That, the whole hike took about six hours. So we started around noon and then we got back to the truck at about six. So, so it was uh, perhaps slow compared to walking over, you know, a city street or something, but it was a beautiful afternoon and the weather was really uh, quite favorable for us, which was great. But it is, it is slow walking across Tundra for sure. It was, it was great though. It was awesome. Totally want to go back and do it. <laughs> I liked how you described the whole tundra there, Kate, and it, it's really hard for people that haven't been on tundra to um, get the sense of what it might be like to walk on it. In, in one of my journal entries, um, if you're curious, I did, pretty sure I did, I inserted a, a video um, to show what it's like to kind of walk in the tundra, and unfortunately, uh, the quality is not great because I'm trying to keep my balance and not trip and die while I'm doing this video. But um, you can you can go see this video um, and kind of just watch my feet kind of sink in with every single step. So uh, it definitely takes some work and you get back and your legs are sore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially for a long walk like that. I think the other sad thing that we can't have is smell a vision because the tundra uh, has its own smell as well. Um, which I happen to be a fond lover of that smell. It's a good smell. It is a good smell. Yeah, I, I actually noticed it, I think maybe the, the second day I noticed the, the rhododendron. Was it mm. the rhododendron that I was noticing, the letum? Yeah, yeah, it has a, a wonderful smell. It had sort of like a pine smell to it. It was really nice. Yeah, so Judy posted a question to have Emily maybe talk a little bit about her research. That's a great idea, so let's hear from Emily. And you can have Kate move slides around or do something if you need to. But I, my um, primary reason to be up here was to help Doni with her research, but I had my own smaller research project going on this summer where I looked at moss and the moss species around Tulik and just to see if they differed in their amount, the amount of water they could hold. Um, yeah, I found... I, I looked at five different moss species and just kind of see, saw which ones could hold the most water. And you also looked at the habitats that they were in, right? Yeah, and I looked at the habitat areas that they were in. Oh, and how many species of moss are up here? A lot. A lot. There are many. Many um, more than five. <laughs> she was just focusing on five of the most common ones, so. Yeah. The, the tundra is kind Pro of probably between moss. 30 and 50 bryophyte species, mosses, liverworts. So yeah, there's actually a lot more diversity in the non-vascular plants than in the vascular plants. Kind of amazing, actually. Cool. Um, I stopped sharing your uh, space there, Kate, so they could see you guys because you're just a tiny little box. So it's nice to see your faces. Um, so at this point, is there any questions from the audience? Anybody that wants to ask their questions live, you're welcome to turn on your video and your mics and I ask have a question directly. For, for Emily, actually. Um, Emily, why don't you tell folks how you got interested in biology and research? Okay. Um, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to study when I went into my undergrad degree, when I started college, but I took biology classes and I, it, I just kind of kept taking them because they interested me. And then I eventually, 
Um, I was looking for a student job at the university and I met Dr. Bret Hart and I started working in her research lab, learned more about um, plant ecology. And I came up here last summer as a volunteer to help with the pluck and help sort out all the samples that I'd be working with back in the lab the next year, which was really interesting. And after that, I, did my, I started doing my own independent study with Dr. Bret Hart um, back at the university. And that was with alder plants and growing my own little alder plants from seeds to see if um, their germination could be affected by different factors. And I mean, it, just, it was kind of a gradual process of taking more classes and becoming more involved in the research and biology that was happening at the university. Yeah. All right. I, I think um, that's a really common story for, for students to sort of understand is like a, a lot of students sort of have this idea of, um, well, uh, to be a scientist, I have to be uh, somebody who's always been good at, at math and science class and um, just had this kind of desire to do it from a, a really early age. And it, it doesn't necessarily always um, work out like that. And you may start to kind of discover um, that you really like science and math kind of later in life and in college. So um, I, I like to tell my students and other students that it's, it's always um, kind of a, a don't, don't peg hole yourself into um, a, a category quite yet until you get into college and you kind of start taking all those different classes and um, looking at all of those different opportunities. Absolutely. All right, let me see. Um, great advice and uh, thank you uh, for sharing there, Emily. Let's see, I don't think there's any more questions that I see at the moment. Um, Kate and uh, Doni, how much longer are you there working? What's the wrap up plans? I leave tomorrow morning. Um, so I get on a, a, am I on a van? A van. van yep. Going on a van. Uh, <laughs> Nine, nine hours back to Fairbanks and then overnight at Fairbanks and then I, I fly home the next day. Um, I think Emily is here for another week. I'm here for another week. Yep, and I am too. So we're kind of wrapping up the season now. We have one more task out at Sagwon. We're putting out resin, uh, anion exchange and cation exchange resin bags to look at just how much Nitrogen is available in the summer versus the winter. We have some that are out there now for the summer and we're gonna put one more set out for the winter and measure soil temperatures. Over the winter, we'll download the soil temperatures from the summer too. And then we just have to sort of finish the weighing and pack up the lab. And I actually have a meeting next week with NSF folks and um, CPS folks related to the Tulick Field Station Management. Um, but then after that, we're heading back to Fairbanks and Emily's starting class and yeah, we're into the fall. Mm -hmm. Seems like it's all going by very quickly. Yes. <laughs> As it does. It does, it does. All right. Well, thank you both, or all three of you, sorry, for uh, sharing there. And if nobody has any questions, um, we'll uh, wrap this up. I do want to thank the National Science Foundation for funding Polar Trek and Tulick Field Station and Doni's uh, great work and the opportunity for uh, Kate to go out there and join her. We, um, we love it. It's an awesome program and we're happy to um, support it. So uh, this event, like I said at the beginning, will be archived and we'll post it online and send it out to everybody that's registered. And we wish uh, Donny the best of field research, the rest of your field research time there, and, and uh, Kate, a good trek home. So, and we thanks to everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. It's great to have the opportunity to do this. Thank you.